three people and you're going to have four weeks do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it works. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello, and welcome to the Technique podcast, where we interview artists about technology. My name is Sam Fry, and this month's episode features an interview between my co-host Richard F. Adams and storymaker Giles Lane. Giles is an artist and designer that is fascinated by how people create and share knowledge. He's one of the directors of the independent artist-led creative studio Probosis, alongside Alice Angus. There he works on projects that enable storytelling through engaging with different kinds of people in different places. This episode includes conversations about storytelling, rituals and how we use data around the world. The interview is a little longer than usual but it's worth the listen as I know personally that I found it to be a fascinating conversation. So I'll hand you over to Richard and Giles starting with Giles explaining how he works as an enabler of storytelling. The way I normally describe what I do is story making. And the idea is that I'm not the storyteller myself. What I, what I do is I create the space for stories to emerge and evolve. And sometimes that's through making physical spaces, sometimes it's through creating digital platforms, uh, sometimes it's through physical objects, and, and also through the creation of modes of understanding what, where value lies for different people. And a lot of what I find most interesting as I negotiate this rather curious thing of how do you define yourself, you know, and I do use the word artist. For a long time I avoided using it because I found it very uncomfortable. But now I... I Why I did you find it me. uncomfortable? I, I think because I was... I, I didn't want to make work that sat in galleries. And so... I, 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 f- I never found myself being very enticed by the, the, the art world and the world of galleries and very fashionable, very cliquey, inward-looking world operated. And by the end of the 1990s, I, I had decided to move completely away from that. And uh, I'd set up Proboscis in the mid-1990s, around 94. We began for the very first time doing what we did, which then became Proboscis a year or two later. But by the end of the 90s, I was so sick of, of what I, the, the sort of the inward-looking self-obsession I saw of the art world and artists, and almost without reference to the wider world of culture, which I thought was much bigger and broader. A bubble. It was. It was like a little yeah. bubble but with, within something much greater than itself, but it just refused to, see, to me to really engage outside of that. And I thought that was a much, it was much more interesting to turn my attention away. And that was done very explicitly and we, we reformulated Proboscis in 1999 as a, as a, as a, a, um, a sort of a research vehicle and the idea was to do creative research um, uh, we didn't quite know what that meant um, I was just about to ask you what does that mean but it, f- f- the way I, I saw it as being it was about and, and the way I often describe what I do is that I don't make artworks deliberately that's not what I do what I do is I bring the sensibility of an artist and artistic practices into different arenas. So sometimes I might be working with a particular community of people. Now they could be, they might be uh, senior civil servants or senior academics uh, working around policy, uh, or it might be, as um, I also do, might be working with a a community of geography. So for the last seven years, I've been working very closely with a community in a remote village in Papua New Guinea. And so it's quite, you know, it's quite broad and the lens goes from, you know, the very, the micro to the very macro. Sometimes we're looking at kind of affecting policy because we think that's the best way to, to make an artistic intervention. Is it functional art then, in the sense that it, it turns the wheels of something? I hope so. 
Yeah. I hope so. I'm not sure we're always successful. Well, I like that. But, but I think that's the, the intention is to be active in culture. Mm. And by culture, I mean society, economics, business, everything. People come with a fixed idea of what they think art is, and then when they're inducted into a process which isn't, doesn't, you know, end up with a, a piece of sculpture or a, or a painting on a wall, then they're somewhat flummoxed by that. But, but, the, but conversely, people are also quite open and willing to enter into new experiences. And I think this is where a lot of digital art and, and artists who have worked in, this, in the kind of the really, the, the bleeding edge of this field have actually made really significant inroads on a, on a bigger cultural level than I think perhaps they might be given credit for uh, is precisely that we've been given an, a, a sort of an agency that it, it's almost as though people haven't realised that's what we were doing they haven't they haven't they haven't realised it was art that they were interacting with and so somehow they've approached it without some of the preconceptions and sort of the prejudices that people often do come to. and there's, I mean, the classic thing where people say to me is, oh, what kind of artist are you? And I'm like, well... What with a capital what A? What do you mean? <laughs> and they so, nearly yeah. always say, well, you know, what's your medium? And I'm like, yeah. well, my medium is media. You know, it's whatever, whatever we choose. I've had great, at my recent exhibition, I've had terrific examples of people asking me, you know, because the images I've made are all digital, are computational... Mm but they are on canvas and they are in frames. <laughs> and they really struggled sometimes to get that grasp. Well, it's not paint, but it looks like paint. Yeah. And so, yeah, they're meant to be simulacra of paintings, you know. And people still haven't got that language, whereas I think, as a habitant of uh, Instagram, I do see a lot of abstract work mm. that is now more readily accepted by the public, if you like, than it would have been 30 years ago. That modern art rubbish, I think, which we both grew up with hearing. Yeah. Um, but I think people have moved on and accepted that, but I don't think they're ready to accept the next step, <laughs> which, you know, maybe well, a piece I of art that is visualization. I think it's uh, become more confused because now the tools of artistic practice are in the hands of everybody. So everyone's got, you know, most people have some sort of smartphone, for instance. I mean, probably not everybody, but a let's say 80% of the population probably have a smartphone with probably high quality camera and a reasonable quality video camera and the ability to edit it and the ability to live stream, do podcasts as we're doing today. Uh, the, the, all these kinds of tools that we thought were going to kind of democratize uh, communication, they're, they're there, but what are they being used for? And I think there's a confusion because people are confusing the creation of content with the creation of meaning. I think um, it, go, it, it, it reflects back on questions that people were talking about in the 70s. I was thinking particularly uh, around Joseph Boyce and the idea that everybody is an artist. Mm. And I, I don't disagree with that, but I think, there, I think to be an artist is, is to take on a role in society, actually. I think it's all very well to you know, say you're an artist. But to me, I, as I was saying, I think artists have, we have this sort of privilege where we can intervene in places which others aren't countenanced. So for me, being an artist, it's about, the, it's, it's about taking, taking up that privilege and using it to do something. Um, so I'm I mean, quite... Typically me, I've separated with that argument by saying arts versus crafts. Mm -hmm. In that most people are engaged in craft of some sort because they're operating machines to make a, an object. And I always get the response back, and, and an artist is something different to mm. that. Not better or worse, but just different, where the art can have no craft in it, in the sense that it can be a word, or, a, mm. you know, the craft is in the intellect rather mm. than in physical craft. Well, there's another way of thinking about this, which I, I think builds on what you're saying, which is if you think of the hierarchy of... Uh, skill acquisition. So you start off as a as a complete novice, then you become an apprentice, then you become a journeyman, then at a certain point you become a craftsman. So one step up, and then eventually a master craftsman, and then finally you become 
a sort of an artist. Mm. Um, and there are various different degrees of talk about that in terms of knowledge production as well. But I think often most people's use of the tools never gets beyond, say, journeymen, no, or perhaps agree. craftsmen. And I think, and when people talk about this in terms of expertise and skill, there's the difference where for, for the first three or four stages, you're still operating on a rule-based, you learn the rules of the craft. The the big, rules all of the, the photography the sites that talk about the rules of thirds and things mm. on images, and you just sit there and think, well, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to do that. And but you do, I suppose. There's a sense. wonderful description of, an, uh, of a true expert is someone who knows the limit of their knowledge. Mm. So it's not how much you know, it's how little you know in relation to what's possible to know. And that's the moment where you go from being very good at something to being, you know, truly expert. And I think this is the same with, with artists. It's like that moment where you transcend the tools, you transcend the rules of using those tools. That's the moment where your vision becomes bigger. So for me, being an artist is about having a very big vision of the world, which you may or may never achieve. And the tools we use are, are, are about effecting ways to deliver some element of that vision and sharing it with others. I mean, this comes back into work of yours I've seen where you've had, uh, I think, I'm thinking back to story cubes. Mm. Physical paper and card cubes, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah. And then at the same time, you're currently working on things about computer visualisation of data from the Antarctic. <laughs> and, you know, that to me is a classic, modern, uh, contemporary art approach. Mm. And absolutely the right approach to take, in that it doesn't matter anymore what the material is. Yeah. It's whether it's the right material for the yeah. message. Absolutely. I mean, the story cubes were, were an experiment and became a product. They were an experiment of thinking, how could we create a very, very simple way of telling visual stories in three dimensions? And the obvious thing to use was the cube, because you could build it in blocks. We, we experimented with a whole series of different designs, and eventually I came up with a, a, a very simple cruciform design that we could then stamp out of paper and card. And it became a very important mechanism for us to do uh, engagement work. So we've used it all over the world um, as a means of helping people unlock stories. Uh, and so well, sometimes they're creating them, sometimes we How do they do that? Often we get people to actually, they create, they use the story cubes and they write or they draw on the cubes. So basically themselves. they are drawing yeah. on the faces of the cube. Absolutely. So just uh, uh, the last... Uh, workshop I did with this was probably about a year ago actually um, where I specifically used the cubes and I was working with uh, architects and urban planners um, and it was they, I used it as a, a as part of a, a bigger workshop uh, and it was one of the activities we used to get people to think beyond the horizon so the whole workshop was about getting them to not think about do horizon scanning about what's the next exciting technology coming through that's going to influence urbanism but to try and think well what's beyond it and it's about uh, it's it's kind of really a consequence scanning rather than horizon scanning we can see what's on the horizon what we can't see is what happens as a result of what we can see so that it's about getting people to step one step further to try and go beyond what they can see and think about what might be the potential consequences of the things which are you know just perceptible now and if we can begin to think about those consequences, we can then reflect back on the present and on the whole series of journeys that, do te that will take us into the future. So we use the story cubes uh, in a number of ways to get people to kind of do a little sort of... to do sketches. Uh, and then literally we get people to come together and someone starts off and they place their cube on a table and they tell a little story and then someone else joins their cube to the bit of the story that ah, they think there's a you. connection to. And then you do that, and eventually when you've, you know, you're running a workshop with 40 people, it's taken the you know, best part of an hour and a half, and the stories that have been generated are, you know, very, there's a lot of very, very fresh things, because as people connect with stories, and they connect their story to it, new things emerge to them that they hadn't considered before. So this is what I mean about sort of unlocking stories and unlocking value, where the value and the values are seeing what you, what you value and how you can share that and connect with others.
actually what I've noticed with our work is the feedback comes a year or two or three years later. Yeah, yeah. But often what people say to us is, I had this amazing, or, or I had a vision or an insight perhaps in the workshop, but it was a bit ungraspable at the time. And then they, they'll talk about how it kind of came back something else. So they've gone away and processed it and then they, they put it in it. another context and back. Yeah. And it's usually, I, w- I would say, three quarters or more of the feedback we get from people is not immediate. It's a year, two, or even five years later, people say, I remember going to this thing, or I remember seeing this work of yours at this place, and you know, I went on this journey, and then at a certain point, it hit me, and I traced it all the way back, and I, now I know that was the bit that set me off on this new path. So we get that, but that's that's um, it's always far too late to share with the funder. <laughs> no, well, yeah, <laughs> and they're not interested by that point. No, they're only interested in what happens. But as an artist, you're actually to me, you're doing your job at that point because that's proving you're doing your job. Because actually, what you've created is having an impact in, in unexpected ways, yeah. in a way. Um, and I do think it. I do think it's because it's art. It's necessarily diffuse. Mm. So I don't think we see a lot of cause and effect instrumental change from what we do I, th- I think we help people begin a process of transformation in themselves I think that's often what art does it's you know that moment when you encounter you know one of the classic great works of art in you know the Prado or the Tate or the Louvre and, and you see something and it just speaks to you that moment it doesn't change you there and then, but it begins a process. You identify with something; it triggers a, a, a spiritual or a psychic or or a psychological realization at some level. But it takes time for that to work its way through, and it might be a lifetime before you know what the effect is. I think when we look, too often we're asked for sort of immediate instrumental evaluations of the impact of our work, and it's very difficult mm. to give. But I saw someone posted something recently. Uh, it was a, a, a little exchange on Twitter that I uh, dipped my toe into, um, which I don't often do, but every now and again. Um, and it was someone, of, uh, someone who works as a, the lead on a, on a national fund um, for one of the lottery distributors, um, talking about you know, the importance of digital technologies in transforming the work of civil society organisations. Let's put it for that. And just and and we're going on about you know some of the. Um, some of the sort of the the the, uh, the usual suspects uh, in the field, you know, Nesta and those those kinds of organisations. And I just I just piped up to say, don't forget the role that arts digit arts organisations who've been experimenting and using and adopting and 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 leading actually, I think, in the adoption and use of digital practices since the mid nineties. Uh, and, and the response back was, well, you know, I've been to a few exhibitions, but I can't think of, you know, what any artists have done to... to and, and I was thinking, this is... This is, this know, is the problem, and what they end up doing, I yeah. think, is often recycling things that artists mm. have seen that they could have actually taken as a starting point. But, it, but, just, um, yeah. but just imagining that the only... The only way, place that artists intervene is in a gallery, just I thought was well, staggering. Well, I, mean, I know. Absolutely That's, staggering. Uh, and well, it prompted me to But think that's actually, people who aren't art educated in, in, yeah. a, in a broad sense. Mm. Because actually, certainly I was taught by conceptual artists, so it, it was game on. You know, you could yeah. produce whatever artifact you wanted. And so it could be stood in the street naked yeah. or whatever you chose to do. Yeah. You know, um, but the kind of willful ignorance. Uh, it, I, I mean, for me, one of the greatest inspirations, uh, well, there are a number. I mean, I think about. Um, the mass observation movement, you know, set up by artists. Um, You think of, uh, you think specifically of the artist placement group and their attempt to go in and negotiate, well, they did, they negotiated a treaty with Whitehall and uh, then placed artists uh, in senior positions in public bodies in the late 70s through till at least about 1980 or 81. And then you think of all the different ways that artists have sort of, you know, had an effect on society. And then I was thinking about, well, a lot of us were very early adopters 
of digital technology, even in the way that we operated and ran our, our, our organizations. And often we shared, I spent a lot of time in the early 2000s uh, talking with other NGOs and showing them how we did what we did and what, how the tools could benefit them. But of course, a lot of that is not very instrumental. And then, you know, it's, 20 years later, so you turn around and someone says, well, you know. Well, it's the academic research thing as well, in that it's not validated until a body has stamped it. Yeah. And, and I think this is often the problem. Because if you do protest yeah. art, you know, who's recording it? Who's validating that? You know, it might validate itself as something that lives in history, but it's often there and gone at the same time as a physical thing. Mm. And uh, that doesn't work for bodies that are funding things. <laughs> they have to have the validation. I'm just doing it myself at the minute, filling in a form after an exhibition to give to the funder to say, this is how many people came on each day. Oh, fuck that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> people came and talked to me about death. Mm. which was the point of the exhibition, you know. But it doesn't work for the finance and funding things. And it's, but that's always a dichotomy, isn't it? It is. In 2012, I led a project called Life Streams, which was a collaboration with some scientists at Philips uh, who had a small research lab in Cambridge, um, and it was part of a, a, a project called Visualize. It's a series of public art projects around Cambridge that were commissioned by Anglia Ruskin University. And we were commissioned to collaborate with Philips. And the scientists at Philips, they, they just finished a very, very large project um, in telehealth. So Philips made a, a, a set-top box called the Motiva platform and it spoke to lots of device that chronically ill people might have. And it created, it was a bit like a, uh, a Sky TV box, so uh, all the data from whatever your chronic illness was, um, from the various things that measured whatever needed to be measured, so whether it was your blood sugar or how much water you were drinking or you know whatever it was, that all gets fed through to your physician, and then the physician is able to monitor your health in more like real time. And it was very interesting. They'd finished. It was a huge study. Had just finished. As you know, telehealth has been mm. a huge area of research for 40-odd years. <laughs> They'd had 6,000 participants over five years, and 40% of those who were expected to die didn't die. And so there was this dramatic up uptake in the improvement not only of lifespan, but quality of life was also measurably improved by by this idea. So they were, uh, they were saying to us, okay, this project is finished, and we're thinking about, okay, those, are, those people in that study were chronically sick. What about healthy people, or people who think they're healthy? So they were suggesting, you know, this was 20, beginning of 2012, so things like Fitbits had been around for about maybe two years. They hadn't become as popular as they have become now, but they were just beginning to be a thing, and so... The guys at Philips were saying, well, the one thing we know about these devices is that 90% of them get switched off after four weeks. And they said, well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to do an experimental project with you thinking about why does that happen and what, what would increase people's motivation in using this sort of self-quantification to perhaps recognise patterns that might lead to illness later in life. Uh, and would that be a good thing and how might we do it? So we ended up thinking about how the, the, the screen-based interactions with the data that's being generated by these uh, self-quantifying devices simply didn't enable people to uh, connect it with the stories that, I mean, we tell... Internally, we are always making stories about ourselves, telling little narratives about what we do and why we do them, constructing identity around our patterns, our habits, the, the, the way we dress, the way we look, how we walk in the street. All these things are part of the stories that we're constantly constructing around ourselves. And it just struck me, actually, that um, looking at a diagram on a smartphone or a smartwatch just simply didn't connect with any of that. It, there wasn't any, it didn't really provide the grist for the mill. And I thought, you know, the other thing is a lot of our work is about hybrid Technologies, so things which cross over between the physical and the digital. Uh, so that was our sort of initial uh, way of thinking about this as well. We, we've got to make this 
uh, connect out back into the, the, real, the real world of material and things and thingness. People often carry objects that are talismanic or totemic with them, that they invest with meaning. A classic one I found is I, f- I found quite a few uh, men of a certain age, similar to me, <laughs> and me. Had, uh, would, would often uh, have uh, a, a, a pebble or a collection of pebbles. And often it's where they taught their child to swim or, yeah. or something like that. And it's often you pick it up from the beach and it, you, it just is a way of locating a memory very similar to a lot of the sort of theatre of memory yeah, concepts yeah. that uh, uh, <clears throat> have been written about over the years. So this idea that we can, we can invest meaning and agency into often quite abstract things. And so from that, I started to think, well, what if we, instead of always using arbitrary objects, what if we could actually make an object out of data from ourselves? And so working with uh, my colleague, uh, Stefan Coopers, um, we came up with this idea of making life charms. So as people will you know, wear charm bracelets that, again, also uh, send a, another way of wearing jewellery is often another way of marking a moment or marking uh, and investing meaning and memory into a, a thing that you carry with you. We thought, well, what if we could develop an algorithm where we could flow data from things like Fitbits, from a range of different yeah. sensors, but also not just sensors. Sometimes it might be observable phenomena mm. that we could uh, capture. What if we could flow that into uh, an object that you could then carry with you, and then that would that it would be the data itself. It wouldn't be a representation of the data. It would be an expression of the data, uh, just in a different form. To So you wouldn't look at it in any way different. It wouldn't be any less the data than any of the other visualizations we've got, but it would allow us to kind of interrogate it in a tactile way that we're not able to just looking at a diagram or looking at a bar chart. So that, that became the live streams project, and we've, we ran a series of uh, experiments with that. And the last experiment we did a few years later was looking at uh, working with Parkinson's uh, disease and patients who had Parkinson's. And there what we discovered was uh, that there are over 70 motor tests that are done for people with Parkinson's to assess the extent uh, of, of the Parkinson's disease in their body. Um, but for practical and policy reasons, all these 70 tests get compressed into a single one called the Unified um, Parkinson's Disease Rating System or Rating Scale, which is a 1 to 100 number system. And then treatment, people often get treatment depending on where they fall. But people, because there are so many tests, people with very different symptoms can score very similarly Mm. and require completely different therapies. But because they fall into this one bracket, only certain therapies are available. So we did an experiment using the the algorithm, and and I should say that the the objects we made were then 3D printed in a a variety of different materials. So we used this same model to show how, if you express the data in a different form, you can show that, uh, despite the fact that people are scoring similarly, the, because of the interactions uh, of, the, of, of the algorithm and the data, each time it would generate a very different form. So you, you'd be able to get some way of... Uh, you could still have the 1 to 100 chart, but you could also demonstrate to policymakers that here are three people who all score, say, within five points of one another. But by expressing the data in a different form, we can show you how qualitatively different their experience is. <laughs> So this is all the backstory to the to the to the new project. So what Tom and I, I so I'd had this idea um, talking with another friend of mine who's done a lot of work in Antarctica, a, a Chilean uh, filmmaker and anthropologist who's based in Australia. And we'd been talking about could we do something with the live streams process and with climate data, and couldn't figure anything out. And then Tom uh, suggested we talk about three years ago, and we hit it off, and and we just figured out this is this would be the right way to do it. And so the idea is that we're going to combine some of the, the, the approaches that Tom had for thinking about um, the kind of complex inter, interconnecting and intersecting uh, climate change phenomena 
with, and then think about, well, what if we express this differently? So we're not making video projections, but we're going to make initially small-scale objects, then we're going to move to slightly larger sculptural scale, and then our sort of our third area uh, is to think about, well, let's, let's use the data to create a space that we can inhabit, so where you're inhabiting the data. So we get we experiment with different scales, with different levels of, uh, with different materials. So we're looking at all different kinds of materials that we're going to be working with. But a really big part of it is about how do we make things which have seemed for so long very remote, how do we make them proximate? So the way I often think about this is we live in a very artificial environment. It's very difficult to see how climate change is really affecting us. But when I go and work in the jungle in Papua New Guinea, I've been going there since, again, since 2012, and every year something which would normally happen at that time of year doesn't happen. So it might be a crop's not grown, or the rains have come at the wrong time, or the winds haven't come, things which have been happening without fail for certainly hundreds, if not thousands of years. And some of the communities... It's very unclear, but Papua New Guinea has continuous human inhabitation for f at least 40,000 yeah. years. So it's, and people have incredibly long memories there. They talk about, they, they know what individuals did five generations back. <laughs> I mean, compared to us, we're, we're, we know so little about our forebears, except what's written well, in we, history We've books. seen the boom in you know, ancestry and yeah. places, sites like that. But, but, you know, I've been taken around ancestral land, and people point out, they know who planted what tree. How do they record that? Do they just tell stories memory. to each other? They tell stories. It's done through memory and storytelling. They make things as well. So there's a lot of... Uh, and designers. They're, they're very keen visual designers. So there, there's a wealth of very complex designs in that community. And they all have meaning. So, for instance, I've been given quite high-status objects as... as part of the work that I've, I've done with the community. And they, they, they make these bowls, and the men make bowls in one particular way, and the women make them in another way. It's all very highly symbolic, and the men and women of each different lineage within the community have different designs that they uh, are allowed to use, and the design will be about their connection to particular places, particular uh, sort of like spirit places like um, springs or pools water or particular uh, groves of trees, these things all have very specific meaning and they're often related to what, what they think of as, as the sort of the ancestors, so the ones who are beyond memory, so people who probably existed, you know, a thousand or more years ago, or six, seven hundred years at the earliest. What appear to us to be very com communities that exist with very little information, actually there's a huge amount of information. I mean, the particular community we work with, they have a whole musical language as well as a spoken language, and they use drums and drum beats. So every individual in the village has an individual drum beat that refers just to them. Mo every significant this is like Wales place, song, isn't it? It's... Every significant <laughs> place. Yeah. So they they jokingly call it their bush telephone. Wow. So they sit and they drum things out, and if you know how to listen to it uh, and then one of the, they, they reckon they're the last village in that area which has retained this which used to be but is this there. about place because I, I on a very very tiny scale certainly in the communities I grew up in in the pit villages there was a lot of that memory of people yeah. and of course they were insular places where people didn't move yes and I, is that about staying in the same land I think so I think that is it. I think that's a really big part of it it's about a rootedness to context. We don't anymore, do we? Well, our culture has chosen We've to go gone, boom, yeah, all over the place. We've, it's, and, and our knowledge is all context-free. And I yeah. think this is where we've, we're reaching perhaps some sort of... I don't know if it's, if it's a limit, but I think we're, we're definitely pushing the envelope on this. And it's... Uh, well, knowledge is meaningless without context. And you can see that in its basic forms. Mm on all the politicking and social media arguing that's going on. Yeah. One person can pull a fact out, another person can pull another fact out, and both appear equally valid. But actually, once you contextualise them, 
one becomes more <laughs> important than the yeah. other. But very often, those are not contextualised. So I, I think this is why, if we, I, and I think this is often the, the free floatingness yeah. of digital technology and digital information that it's it is often context free. So partly what we're trying to do by experimenting with digital fabrication techniques, but rooted in you know good solid scientific data. So we're work, we're working with um, the British Antarctic Survey on this project as well. So they will be working with us to sort of select what, what are the kind of key bits of climate change data we could look at where they're creating these complex interactions that are very hard for people to understand. And if we can find ways to express that in a physical format that people can touch, that they can walk around, that they can even a, a space you can walk into and feel some sense of uh, presence and connection uh, within it, that that way we might be able to create context where it's it's been removed so that's sort of the aim i mean it is a research project we might fail yeah yeah, 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 yeah. um but, but you might get something that pushes things forward and hopefully even and if in we three, three years, years somebody might come back to you and say yeah. <laughs> even if we fail if yeah. we do it well then the failure could be useful and interesting and it might help others you know generate other other experiments further down the line I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing about a place, about information context. You know, I, I sat watching my cat walking around. The first thing he does when he goes in a room is smell everything. Mm. And you suddenly think, what is the world like to a cat? Do you, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. But, but his dreams are probably smells, they are probably sounds. You know, and we rely so much on our vision, on our yeah. auditory sensors and sometimes touch but not not really but well I, I was going to say my, my introduction to working with in Papua New Guinea um, is it's th all through an anthropologist called James Leach who uh, I've known for, for some time and um, James came uh, he one of the other things we do is the, is the downloadable book format the diffusion ebooks and the, the booklet platform that we enable other people to design and make their own books with. And ten years ago, James got in touch with me and said, look, I'm bringing two of the people that I work with in the village. And James has worked with this, this one village in Papua New Guinea since the early 1990s. So he's had this really 20, over 25-year relationship with them. And ten years ago, he came to me and he said, I'm going to bring two of the villagers to the UK uh, and they're going to look at objects that the British Museum have in the ethnographic store uh, that are from, largely from the part of Papua New Guinea that they're from. Uh, and they're just going to look at them and tell stories and say what they can about them. It was part of a bigger research project that was going on. And James said, he said that the, the, the museum will photograph the objects and will record the conversation, but I'd really like to work with you around documenting it in a more active way as well. So we used the, the uh, Diffusion ebook format to make live field notebooks, and I did photographs of us in doing the interaction. But again, what struck me so incredibly strongly was the two uh, Papua New Guineans who came over, Pore and Pimbin, they touched everything before they spoke about it. They picked it up, they felt it, and you could see that if it was a piece of wood, they picked it up and they, they didn't just know the, what the wood was by sight. They knew it by touch. That's they could tell it was from this tree. And you could see that they knew it more by touch than by sight. It was something they knew the grain. They've got that depth of tacit knowledge about the world that they inhabit. And sometimes they would say, oh, we think that's for this purpose. But then they would say we don't have those, or this particular thing, it's not in our culture, and Papua New Guinea has this, you know, this enormous diversity of languages, and people literally didn't, mm. you know, uh, different language groups would live within a, say, you know, two or three valleys, and it's so mountainous there, they simply wouldn't have contact for hundreds or... Very little Very long time. Yeah. 
with with people even in neighbouring valleys because the, phys- the physical you know there was just no point playing over there for for uh, any great reason so it has this enormous diversity of culture over 830 distinct separate languages and it was absolutely extraordinary they would say well we don't know what this thing is but we know what it's made from and so what they would then talk about is they would say well it's been it might be a series of grasses that have been woven in a particular way and they would say well you know I don't know what that object is but if you weave it in this way then this thing happens or this is the significance in our community so we can speculate that you know perhaps this object was made for these reasons but it was interesting they would interpret it not they would interpret it through a, a really detailed understanding of the material of what the thing was. What do the people in, in Papua New Guinea think you're doing? <laughs> they must be curious. Yes. A, a couple of years later, an opportunity came to present the, the, the diffusion uh, ebook process, the, the, book, the handmade books, mm. the, which are both... Uh, physical and digital at a, a, a symposium around trad- recording, documenting and recording traditional knowledge and we hadn't done that in particular but it was something I'd been thinking about for a long time and we'd done some little experiments uh, between a school in Nigeria and a school in London uh, getting the students to exchange make books for each other and, and exchange them so we had some sense of the difficulties of working in a non-Western environment where they don't have computers and printers and things are contentious. But I, I had this, this sort of feeling that what we were doing would be useful for people who understand making but also want to find new ways to document and tell stories. And there's, a, there's this big sense that these kind of indigenous cultures are disappearing very fast mm. and it's, that's not, that's not a, an untrue... Uh, intuition at all it's definitely true that things are changing rapidly and so we went and I presented and then at the end of the symposium I got to go to the village itself and we spent a week or a week or so there Uh, and we just did a little experiment I took a a waterproof paper and then I just handmade booklets and I think I made 16 booklets I had just enough paper um, but we spent a lot of time thinking about the questions. What would people want to record? What were the stories? And so we spent a lot of time working with a, a small group of the villagers to think about what were the key prompts um, if they were going to record traditional knowledge. What, what you know, what was important? Lineage was particularly important. You know, where do you get this knowledge from, mm. and what right do you have to share it with anyone else? This is was an absolutely critical series of questions and we also on the front of each book has a very simple a free prior informed consent statement which says this is what it's about um you know and, and then the idea is people can agree or not agree and they can indicate on the very front of the book whether they want the book to be shared whether they want it to be scanned whether they want it to be you know stored online or made shareable so this idea that you know someone could just make a book and keep it at home if they didn't want to share it with anyone else. But if they did want to share it, they could, they could also indicate you know, the degree to which they want to share it. And then uh, in, in the sort of ethical uh, approach we've come up with, you, you, know, you can see immediately if you're looking at a book that's been scanned and they've crossed out that they want it to be online and you're looking at it online, you know that someone along the chain has broken the ethical mm-hmm. contract or the bond. So then the onus becomes on you to say, you know that someone doesn't want you to read this. Do you read it? So it was about trying to think about, we can't stop knowledge proliferating in in a promiscuous digital world, but we can also throw ethical challenges in there so that, you know, if it does, if if knowledge... How do we deal with it if it does happen? And that's choices that all of us have to make. We can't just say, oh, well, you know, some other bad actor. If you're deliberately reading something which you know that you're not supposed to, then, you know, that's that's an ethical choice that you're making. So we, 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 we kind of worked out some of those frameworks in the village doing that, figuring out these questions, and it's it's a complex and challenging process. And then we just handed them out to a range of people and they went away and they wrote 
stories about about particular plants that they know, particular things. But the, for, for me, one of the most amazing things was I made, I think, 16 books. We got all 16 back before the end of the week that I was there. And it's the only time I have ever done any form of engagement project with a 100% participation rate. There was something, they, they're hungry for something. Mm. And I didn't know what it was. But so, And this became... Um, this little experiment led to we managed to get uh, a couple of rounds of funding and we've gone back over the intervening years and it's become a whole platform and a whole system that we've developed for uh, small indigenous communities who might have a little bit of access to paper a lot of communities even remote ones now have a lot of people have smartphones Uh, there is not much but there's there's, there's some digital uh, connectivity coming and often a village will have a school and the school will probably have a laptop or probably a printer so the ability for people to actually use the booklets to make and record things is, is definitely it, it, it's becoming quite practical the interesting thing though is of course they don't consider what they write in the books to be knowledge because to them knowledge is the relationship between two people so when you put something in a in a book it's more like a sign so what we realized they were doing with the books was not making books which then become a store of knowledge they're making books as a way of enacting knowledge between them so often the books are made by more than one person at a time and they're also the author uh, and we, we usually put a, 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 we print out a little photo and stick it on the front so you can see who the author is. But one of the things we've noticed is people put their children or their grandchildren's picture on the book. Oh. So the books and the process of making and recording they're whatever handing it, it is, down the line, aren't exactly. They? <laughs> it's it's uh, and and they're already investing the authorship of the book not in themselves but in the person to whom they they've been communicating and making it with. So it's really interesting. I mean, it's a really different way of thinking about what what what, what art is, what um, what creation involves, what knowledge is. I was saying earlier, you know, often we we have these we carry little totem objects with us and we invest them with meaning, and it's it's a very sort of trivial thing in our culture. But in this other di- other space and this other culture, I'm able to see how. They, to them, it's not trivial. It's it's absolutely full of important meaning, um, and it's how they construct a worldview around them, so that the object uh, isn't valuable in and of itself. It's valuable only in relation to all the people for whom and with whom it's being made. That was Giles Lane speaking to Richard F. Adams. What an amazing set of projects, right? And if you're interested in finding out more about Giles and his work, then you can. Here's how. I'm on Twitter as Giles Lane. Twitter's good. Uh, or people can contact me via the Proboscis website. We've got a very So that's proboscis.org.uk. Um, yes, I can be reached via there. And all of our projects are, are pretty well documented there. So make sure you follow Giles online. Also, while you're at it, make sure you follow us too. We are on Twitter at Technique UK, and you can also sign up for the Create Hub newsletter by going to create hub.com. This was our 30th episode, which seems incredible to me. Thank you so much for continuing to listen. We don't pretend to have a huge listenership, but it is gratifying to see that we do retain a solid regular listenership. We would, of course, like to grow it further, though, so it would be great if you do enjoy these episodes that you could mention our work on social media or give us a five-star rating on iTunes, as both really do help. 
Apologies that this episode was a little later than usual, but we should have an episode again in a few weeks' time. So make sure you listen out to that and make sure you subscribe as well to avoid missing it. So I'll speak to you again in a month's time. And in the meantime, take very good care of yourselves. Goodbye.